so, um, so yeah, three enormous areas uh, where we can look, look at, what, you're not going to like? And so, case for Christ is what we looked at. There is uh, the case for creation and the case for conscience. And again, I'm keeping the alliteration going, just makes my heart happy. And, uh, and so I want to look at just a little bit at the case for God. And uh, to do that, we, again, uh, because we're talking about, you know, uh, building the Christian faith from the ground up. So we don't approach it immediately from saying, well, we're just going to accept everything the Bible says as the word of God. Like we did earlier this morning, we're going to build that case from the ground up and um, not make assumptions right out of the gate. When it comes to the case for God, again, we're not going to start with the Bible. Let's just start from what can we learn from creation that might indicate the plausibility of the God hypothesis of God belief. And um, there's three great lines. And by the way, this is a rich intellectual tradition inside the Christian faith. And so if you look over the last 2,000 years, there's been amazing, amazing Christian thinkers who have asked and answered these questions. And um, some of the arguments that were like lined out, for example, in the 14th century by Thomas Aquinas have gotten massively bolstered by scientific discoveries in the last 100 years. And so I'll just kind of line out three different things here very quickly. There's the fine-tuning argument, there's a first cause argument, and there's a morality argument that are all indicative, or I guess I'd say point to, the plausibility of God. And so, uh, in the fine-tuning argument, this is a fascinating thing, like I said, that was, uh, it was labeled the design argument way back with Thomas Aquinas, but then the more we learn about the universe, uh, the bigger and bigger this particular design argument becomes. The huger and huger this design (laughs) argument becomes, yeah. So, So, here's what we found. We found that the universe, at the level of its fundamental properties, is like a biosphere, and it's like a biosphere that you, like, let's say you went to the farthest reaches of the galaxy and you found a planet, a rock planet, and on top of that dead rock planet was a little, like a, like a biosphere. And, and on the outside of the biosphere were a bunch of dials. And the dials controlled things on the inside of the biosphere, like, you know, temperature, let's say, or uh, pressure, air pressure, or uh, the moisture in the air, and all that kind of stuff, okay? And, and they were tuned just exactly so, so that living things could survive inside the biosphere. We're finding that that illustration perfectly reflects what the universe is. To allow for life, the fundamental properties of the universe have been dialed to a fine, fine hair's breadth of precision to allow for the existence of life. And you ask yourself, well, what are the dials on the uh, on the outside of the uh, of the universe? Well, there are things like the gravitational constant, the the speed of light, the strong nuclear force. So, we, you know, we, we learned about the boson. Remember, we talked about the God particle inside of uh, atoms. We, just, we found that out the last couple of years. That's, that's kind of what creates gravity. Uh, the mass of atomic particles, the cosmological constant. So the gravitational constant is that force that pulls everything together. The cosmological constant is that force that is causing uh, everything to uh, blow apart in the universe. And, guys, what's fascinating about these properties is that they're like, they, they reduce to mathematical formulas, they're complex, you got to go to a lot of school to figure them out, but they uh, are elegant in their uh, overall simplicity, and what's amazing is, is that uh, these things are dialed into a kind of hair's breadth of fine-tuning that will just blow your mind, if you could like, wrap your mind around it. I'll just give you one example. The, the cosmological constant, so that's the mathematical prop, or, uh, 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 um, equation that kind of reflects the force of things blowing apart in the universe. It, it, it's it reflective of how things are, are expanding in the universe. And um, you ask yourself, how much play is there in the cosmological constant? Which, by the way, if it was any different, then at the moment of the Big Bang, everything that was blowing apart would have either shrunk back together again, there would have been no bang, or everything would have been evenly distributed in the universe and there would have been no planets, no stars, no nothing. Just like a homogeneous energy in the universe. So it controls that. That's what this one thing controls. If it was different by one part in 10 to the 60th power. So yes, that's a number, 10, with 60 zeros behind it. The entire world that you see and everything in it would not exist. And uh, the gravitational constant, just to give you another uh, example of this. That's fine-tuned to one part in the 120th power. Now, you say, well, how fine is that? How fine is that? If you could stretch a ruler, 
across the known universe, and it was marked out in increments of, an, of inches, okay? Now think about how big the universe is, 15.7 billion light years across, okay? So imagine one inch relative to the size of the universe. If you took a dial that was that big, and it was marked right here, this is where the gravitational force was set, and you went, doop. The gravitational force would have been changed so radically that planets couldn't form, certainly advanced life forms, nothing that we know of in the universe could form. Now, this, is the kind of, this is the kind of fine-tuning that we're talking about. So scientists are really, it's a real thing. I mean, uh, fine-tuning is not like something that Christians made up to say, you know, see, there's a creator. It's, a, it's just a fact of the universe that it is incredibly fine-tuned. So what explains it? Well, it's either law that explains it, so that would be like a dial on top of the dials, right? Like something that's adjusting all the other adjustments to make them just so. But there's no reason to believe that such a law exists. We've certainly never found one. So um, there, that's really out of the uh, question. But then the only other options you're left with are chance, like we just got really lucky. Like at the inception moment of the universe, all these... Uh, cosmological uh, constant, the gravitational force, the speed of light, all that stuff was just said just so to allow for uh, life to develop. Uh, and, uh, and it was just a big, fat, lucky, you know, roll of the dice when you go to Vegas. So chance doesn't make any sense, especially for scientists. They don't like to leave anything to chance. That's just another way of saying miracle. So what, we've left, uh, what they're left with is to offer up what could explain the chance hypothesis. So maybe universes are just popping out all the time. And this is the multiverse hypothesis where we are imagining that if it's possible that our universe is just one of an infinite number of universes like that are expanding like bubbles on your tub. If you can imagine like the soap bubbles and one goes like this, like this, like this and they just expand and there's an infinite number of them and each one, all these dials are dialed slightly differently. And if there's an infinite number of them, then what are the chances at least one of them's going to get it right? I mean, the chances are slim, but hey, if you've got 10 to the 120th universes, one of them's going to get it right. That's the way they reason. Well, uh, there's no real good scientific reason to believe that the multiverse uh, exists, and we won't go down that rabbit hole, but if we can't go with chance, which is like, you know, imagining that, you know, we go to Vegas and uh, get lucky enough to have a universe like ours, then what we're left with, without law and without chance to explain fine-tuning, we're left with intelligence. And so the improbability screams that this was designed. And it's such powerful uh, evidence that a, a leading atheist, Anthony Flew, basically converted from stringent atheism, and some of you recognize that name, Anthony Flew, he was a hard-baked atheist for 50 years, debated Christians all over the place, and he converted, not to Christianity, but from atheism to theism based on the fine-tuning evidence alone. It's a fascinating and powerful argument. Okay, second is the first cause. And the argument goes like this. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. And again, when Thomas Aquinas, you know, crafted this argument in the 1400s, it was basically a philosophical argument. It's not a scientific argument. It's, a, it's an argument that says you can't have an infinite regress of causes. If you can imagine the universe stretching out like dominoes, right? Like, so, you know, why are you here? Because your parents are here. Why are they here? Because they're parents. And you just, that's, that's the world. The universe is like that. It's a series of causes and effects, but you can't have an infinite series of causes and effect into the infinite past. That doesn't make sense. There has to be a stopping point, a, what Thomas Aquinas called a prime mover, right? There has to be the, 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 first, uh, the first cause is what we've sometimes labeled God, the first cause. So that was a philosophical argument, and it's a really powerful philosophical argument, which we won't get into. Um, but scientifically now, as we've come to understand that the universe is finite, and it had a beginning that there's a powerful scientific basis for the first cause argument. So you imagine that the entire universe, including energy, time, space, matter, and all the physical laws that we know of in the universe, came into existence at a finite point in time in the finite past that um, forever takes off the table the idea that the universe is just eternal. And atheists and pagans recent atheists and ancient pagans have always assumed that the universe was eternal. And there were the Jews, the weird ones, the peculiar ones, who alone in the ancient world said, 
in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So there was mind, and then there was matter, according to the Jews. They're the only ones, it turns out, who had their cosmology in the right order. Everyone else, it was matter, and then mind comes out of it. In your modern evolutionists, that's certainly what they believe. There was matter, and then mind comes out of it. But for the Judeo-Christian model of the universe, it was mind, then matter. And as it turns out, uh, when you imagine that all of time and space and matter come into existence at a point in time, what's before that? Whatever is before that, if, if all time and space and matter come into existence at that moment, that thing can't be uh, bound by time, right? Because time is a property of the universe, right? So whatever that thing is, must be eternal, okay? And so if all matter comes into existence at that point, whatever comes before, the cause of all that must be immaterial. It cannot be uh, made out of matter, and so if space comes into existence at the moment of the conception of the universe, then whatever that thing is must be spaceless, omnipresent. And if whatever that cause is, cause the entire enormity of the planet. Think about the power that's in existence in the universe, in the galaxies, in the stars, whatever that, it must be of enormous power. And so now we have an eternal, omnipresent, spiritual, omnipotent thing. And that's a really great starting definition for God, don't we? So that's the argument from the first cause, and it's really, and you have, we don't need to crack the Bible, and that's where our mind, our reason can take us. Here's a third thing, and then we'll get to your questions. The morality argument, and the argument goes like this. If morals are not objective, there is no God. Right? So if morals are not like fixed in some sort of permanent law-giving place that's objective, then there is no God. Well, morals are objective. And everyone that you meet, including your atheistic buddy and your, you know, your internet skeptic and, and all that, they, everyone kind of knows inherently that morals are objective. They're founded in something that's fixed and unmovable uh, and outside of us, outside of our opinions, our subjective opinions. Therefore, if morals are objective, uh, there is a God. So, uh, so, this is what's fascinating about this is that um, to say that morals are subjective, um, lots of people will say that. Your agnostic buddy will say that. Well, you know, morals are just, you know, relative to the society you grew up in, you know, and that's all that they are. But no one lives like that. No one lives like that. So you can try to imagine, and this is what you need to press on the person who imagines that morals are, are just simply a function of uh, societal constraints or evolutionary forces that enhance survival. What you have to press back on that is just say, well, can you live like that? No one lives like that. And usually what happens is someone is smuggling in objective moral values while they argue that moral values are not objective. I'll give you an example. So you say, your, uh, your atheist buddy says, well, morals are relative. Ask them how they feel about female circumcision in Africa. Okay? And what will they say? That's horrible. Well, why is that horrible? That's what they do. They've been doing it for hundreds of years. That's their culture. I say, no, that's oppressive to women. Okay, so on what basis? I mean, so humans are inherently valuable and see how they've, they've smuggled in value. You understand? They've smuggled in moral order, objective moral order that transcends what they're doing in Africa. They're appealing to this law that somehow stands above what they're doing in Africa and in America uh, and against which female circumcision is judged as immoral, okay? So ask them how they feel about headhunting in New Guinea. Well, that's wrong. Right, that's wrong. And so uh, it's one thing to say that morals are relative. It's an entirely different thing to say, uh, to live like it. And one of the tests of a, of a worldview that's, that's real is a worldview that you can live in the real world. Okay, so there you go. So you've got the fine-tuning argument. You've got the... Um, uh, the first cause argument and uh, the moral argument, and there's others. By the way, these arguments were anticipated by St. Paul. Romans chapter one, he says, for the divine nature, the nature of God can be understood from what has been made, Romans chapter one, verse 19, so that men are without excuse. So there's something about the divine nature that is intrinsic, inherently understood from the world, okay? 
And then in chapter two, same thing. There is a law that's lit, written on the heart that transcends the moral codes uh, that we have written down on paper. All right, so that's just a real basic kind of argument for God. And now I'm gonna flip over my computer so I have the questions in front of me. Well, I bet you they're piling up. Look at that. <laughs> Woohoo! So um, this is great stuff, guys. Thank you. And um, let's start um, processing them. And I brought my glasses so I can read. How does Mormonism in the Book of Mormon stack up against the Bible? That just went right to the top, didn't it? Um, it was interesting. I'm glad that you put this, uh, uh, brought this up because we're comparing the Bible to uh, the Gnostic Gospels. And what were we saying the Gnostic Gospels lacked? It lacked, what was our fancy word? Verisimilitude. Verisimilitude. Now, has anybody read the Book of Mormon? Okay, good. Good for you. We should be open investigators and we should read this stuff. And uh, if you've read it, you know it's the story of what happened in America in the 6th century B.C. I mean, it's a fantastic idea. Now, this is supposed to be a true story. Question, does the Book of Mormon have verisimilitude? In other words, does it look similar to the truth of what we know was going on in the Americas in the 6th century B.C.? And the answer to that is no. And along the same lines... Uh, we can investigate things like geography, places where there were battles that are listed in the Book of Mormon, entire civilizations that are listed. And when we go to the archaeological accounts and we start looking inside the geography and we ask, is there any verisimilitude? And the answer is, there's none at all. Not one red shekel, right? Now, and so, so you're a Mormon friend, and we should be very gracious with them when they knock on our door, but this is really something uh, against their story, is that, I, you know, I, I've been to the Holy Land, right? There is not, you know, you know what they, the scholars use, non-Christian, secular, skeptical scholars use Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the book of Acts and Josephus as their guide, as they're going around wondering, where should we dig, well, let's go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because these have verisimilitude. They actually reflect the world of the first century Palestine. Guess what we don't use when we're digging around North America? We do not use the Book of Mormon because it has shown absolutely zero correspondence to what has actually gone on. And if that weren't bad enough uh, for the Book of Mormon, um, we've looked inside the DNA now of the natives who live here. And according to the Book of Mormon... Native Americans are descended from who? Does anyone know? Jews. They're, they're the lost 10 tribes of Israel, right? So you had the 10 tribes of Israel. They're lost when they got exiled. The Book of Mormon claims that they got on boats and came on over here. So that the, the natives, and including the Incas and all the wild populations and civilizations that live in North and South America, are ain't descended Semites, well, now we've looked into the DNA of Native Americans and we can actually kind of trace their DNA back and guess what they are? Well, guess what they aren't? They're not Jews. They're not Semites. They're Mongolians. They're all descended from North Asian races. So it's a real problem. Let's keep going. Um, what are your thoughts on the book of Enoch from the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Fallen Angels? Um... Well, I, I really am fascinated, honestly, by the book of Enoch and, and, um, um, and the, the, the biblical warfare worldview that's presented to us. Uh, the reason why I'm fascinated by this, I guess, is because um, I think we downplay it. I think we downplay the way in which the Bible talks about a, um, uh, a divine unity of the sons of God. In fact, even if you go to Genesis chapter one, the Bible says, God says, let us, let us make man in our own image. Now, I know we like to say that that is a presaging of the Trinity, but I think every good scholar will tell you that most likely the original readers are reading that not as a presaging of some sort of diversity within the nature of God, though we may as Trinitarians take it, I think, to, to be that, but primarily that was seen as an addressing of the host, the heavenly host, the sons of God. The, there is a spiritual family of God that included all the angels. And um, so uh, the book of Enoch talks quite a bit then about this pre-flood world in which there's, some, there's a lot more interaction between 
humanity and that spiritual family that is, that is heavenly, that is spiritual, non-corporeal. And we would call those angels. Um, so uh, I will say that the book of Enoch is, there's a good reason it's not in your Bible. It's non-canonical because it didn't meet up with the measurement of, of inspiration. There are things in the book of Enoch that are a little kooky, but it was quoted, it was quoted by Peter. It was quoted by Jude. So it was given a lot of weight in the early church. Someone to look into this is a Dr. Um, Heiser. I'm, now his first name, I'm drawing a blank. But Michael, yes, thank you, Dr. Michael Heiser. Who, raise your hand, who said that? Dr. Michael Heiser. Have you read him? Okay. You just got it right. You just guessed. <laughs> That's awesome. So yeah, Dr. Dr. Michael Heiser, who works in Bellingham for Logos, who puts out Bible software. is really good. And he's an amazing. And his whole thing is on this whole idea of the, the heavenly hosts and um, fallen angels and the importance of, of developing a spiritual warfare worldview as you look at the Bible that the world is, is in some sense at war and it, it begins when you have Adam and Eve made in a garden and who meets them there? A, the, the devil, a pre-fallen being uh, meets them there. So lots more to say about that, but I think we're gonna leave that one there. But I wanna send you for further study to a book called Supernatural by Dr. Michael Heiser. It's an excellent book. Next question. Um, what do you say to those who say, I was born this way, born attracted to the same sex or born as the opposite gender than they, than they believe that they are? This is, this is really becoming a huge issue and it's like, it's bumping. Dang it. <laughs> this is becoming, uh, as a guy who kind of really is interested in apologetics and kind of presenting answers, realizing what the, what the main pushback is on the gospel, this is, this is overtaking all the other issues. It's overtaking the creation evolution debate. It's overtaking the, well, how could I believe that a man was God, the nature of Jesus, the reliability of scripture. All those questions are taking a back seat to sexuality. So it's important that we get this right. So I wanna say one thing. When someone says to you, I was born this way, your first response should not be what I think some Christians do, and they way oversimplify this thing, is they, God doesn't make no fags. Okay, that's insanely simple, over, overly simple, and it's, it's rough, and it's not gentle and respectful, which is 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. And I think, friends, it just oversimplifies the situation. Listen, people come into the world born with all sorts of proclivities. Now, what goes into the, the, what goes into the, 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 the formulation, the causation of same-sex attraction? Lots of stuff. And you can just throw inherent constitutional causes in with sociological causes. Just throw them all into a big bucket. And you can just say, yeah, all right. So for all sorts of reasons, my friend, my same-sex attracted friend, you have a desire for sex with people of the same gender. But your logic is broken. Amen. Because what's the logic? They, it's not even, it's, it's just assumed. They throw it out there and Lady Gaga sings it, you know. Baby, yeah, it was born this way. Okay, so wh what's the logic? If I was born this way, therefore, it has moral sanction. I was born this way, therefore, God approves. I was born this way, therefore, it's amoral. I was born this way, therefore, it's normal. That logic is broken. So don't, don't push back on born this way. Push back on the logic. Because you were born broken. And then through a series of besetting issues and through a, through a series of uh, perhaps some constitutional factors, we all know that like, uh, you can just give something over to, to, to your opponent on this. Just give it to them as part of the argument. You know what? People can have all sorts of issues in their hormonal development and you know that affects their sexual development and you know that would affect their sexual attraction. Just give it to them. That will affect you. So if, if, you, wanna, if you wanna say I was born this way, don't, don't dispute that. Dispute the logic. The logic is born this way, therefore God approves. Therefore, this is just another way of doing sex. Therefore, the sexual design of scripture is, is uh, open to new interpretations. That, that's where you just push back on it. And, and then that's where you stand with your same-sex attracted friend. And you say, you, me, born this way. 
and then just dive into Romans chapter seven. You know what? The thing that I should do, the ideal is before me. God's law, his good and beautiful way. And I see it's good and I see it's right and I don't wanna do it. It's there, I see it. I, actually, I, I think I wanna do it, but then there's sin and it lives in me and I don't do it. I, the very thing I wanna do, I don't do. And so if I don't do the thing I wanna do, then what is it that's doing it? I mean, that's that whole, I do, I do that, that passage of the Bible, you know? Just, just dive into Romans chapter seven on this. And just be, stand there with, with your, your same-sex attracted friend. And so then you can just kind of take the judgment piece off the table and then say, listen, you may not agree because you may not love Jesus, but for me, sex has been defined by the master. And so if sex is defined by the master, it has an ideal. It has a way that it was meant to function. And nobody lives in that function perfectly. Nobody. Nobody in this room all you pornographers and masturbators and, you know, and adulterers and fornicators. I'm a man. I'm a man. I know what's going on in your brain. Okay, so, so listen. Okay, hey, we did this, all right? Hey, right, we talked about porn two years ago, right? Wes Roberts. Okay, so everybody's sexually broken. Everybody's sexually broken. This is such a great question because we just, okay, it's really fresh on my mind. Sorry, we're going to take a little extra on this one. The guys in the back going, new question, new question, Ray. Um, uh, listen, uh, we had a guy at our church and uh, he gave us his story last week because we just talked about homosexuality and transgenderism. And here's his story. He was uh, born into a Roman Catholic family. He experienced sexual abuse as a kid and um, he did not experience any heterosexual attraction. He uh, had a gay lover from the time he was 12 uh, through into his early 20s, uh, different gay lovers as he went into college. And, uh, and he, um, uh, he would describe himself, if you could have interviewed him in that moment, he says, I am a gay man. And then he was invited by a couple of girls to a Baptist, you know, revival meeting. And he said, Ricky, you wouldn't believe it. They did everything wrong. It was like heavy handed and thumb screws and super manipulative. And, and, and I met Jesus. And I was like, what, 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 what can I tell you? I mean, they did everything wrong, but they, but I, I, I met Jesus. And he said, I, I knew I was new after that. And then I just had this sort of, a, you know, you know, beautiful new relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I still, uh, looked at gay pornography, and I never had any heterosexual desires. I, I did suddenly realize that, you know, I, you know, marriage was probably off the table. I went to a gay church at that point thinking, I got Jesus now, so maybe I can put homosexuality and gayness together. And he says, you would never believe the feeling, Rick. I walked in, and it felt like walking into a bar. You know, there's a, sem a spiritual kind of thing. I felt like this was disingenuous somehow. His word was hip hypocritical. So he just walked out. And how brave is that guy? To be, yeah, to be same-sex attracted and saying, I got Jesus and I feel the peace of God. I am reconciled with God. And maybe I could put Jesus and gayness together. And he just realizes this, was, this, this wasn't reflective of God's will for his sexuality. So he just walked out and said, I guess I'm gonna walk as a same-sex attracted follower of Jesus, just chaste. This guy's an absolute hero. And by the way, these stories are growing and growing in our day where there are people who just refuse to go either way. They refuse to buy into gay theology, which is, which is really problematic when it comes to Bible interpretation. I mean, it's really problematic, but they refuse to go the other way too. They refuse to say, I'm gonna fake it. I'm gonna fake heterosexual desire. I'm gonna fake heterosexual marriage. They just say, I'm just gonna live. I have same-sex attraction. You know, you wanna be in, you know, uh, uh, you, you, somebody else has a problem with the bottle. Somebody else over here uh, is in an open sexual relationship. Somebody else over here has got some other proclivity. Somebody here is a kleptomaniac. Somebody here is, a, you know, an anorexic, a bulimic. We got problems. I'm just gonna be a struggler with you. And this is an amazing guy. Okay, so now that's faithful walking. Yes. Now what's amazing about this story is when he accepted Jesus, he said two things. Number one, I'm not gonna fake anything. Number two, I'm not gonna tell Jesus how this goes. So Jesus, in Matthew chapter 19, he outlines beautiful expression of godly sexuality. And what is it? It's covenantal, it's faithful, it's monogamous, it's heterosexual. 
Have you not read in the beginning, God made them male and female? People say Jesus said nothing about marriage or gay marriage. Matthew 19, he said lots about marriage. Covenantal, faithful, monogamous, heterosexual, loving. He laid that out because he said, what causes divorce? Hard-heartedness. So therefore, God's plan for marriage is that it be loving, soft-hearted, tender, serving. Okay, so Jesus laid out six parameters for marriage right there. And my friend just said, I surrender to that. And so if I can't live that out, if I can't enter into normal marriage because my own desires couldn't like sustain it, then I'm just going to live chaste as a same-sex attracted follower of Jesus, um, sexually abstinent. When he was 28, he said, I had my first heterosexual thought. And so it's amazing because uh, uh, you'd say, well, that probably wasn't a heterosexual thought, Rick, because he didn't undress a woman. The thought was that he was lying on a beach someplace. He was just, you know, communing with Jesus. And he just imagined a woman's head right here. And that idea that he could be a protector and, uh, and he could be a um, provider and that he could be completed in the feminine, the masculine, was the first heterosexual thought he had in his entire life when he was 28 years old. So let's not, on one hand, say that when a person comes into faith, that they must instantly be healed or instantly be heterosexually married or instantly happy. The call is not to any of those things. The call is to holiness, okay? That's the call. Jesus doesn't call you, right? He says, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me, right? So the same-sex attracted brother, he says, that's what I'm saying to you. Now, it just so happens that as you take up your cross and you deny yourself and you follow, do not discount what the grace and power of God can do. And here's a guy who experienced a change in the strength and direction of his sexual desires. That isn't true of everybody who has same-sex attraction. So, anyhow, that was a long answer. Okay. All right, so what does the Bible say about alien life? Alien life. Uh, uh, the Bible is pro-alien life. Now, and you say, what are you talking about, Rick? Because the Bible has said from the first page that aliens exist. And everyone's looking at me like, what are you going to say? What are you going to say? Right, right. Look, has God made another sentient race in the universe? Yes, we know them. What do we call them? We call them angels. So if God can have another sentient race in this universe that he has a program with, and we don't know everything he's doing with that particular race. We know some of the things. We know that they interact with our race. But we don't know all the things, and if, if that's possible. So the Bible's, all, we're always open to the idea that God could have another sentient race somewhere in this vast, vast, vast universe, and he has a program with that race of which we know nothing. And if we ever discovered such a race, a couple things might be true. Number one, they might be fallen like we are, and God might have uh, conducted a redemption program for them just like he did for us. Or, here's another possibility, that they constitute another reason for mission. And aside from all the horrible abuses of the, of the Christian West when they discovered the races of North America, the, one of the impulses that was mixed in with all the junk was this is, a, this is mission, this is mission. And maybe we'll think the same thing when we travel across the ocean of space and we come across another race of sentient creatures uh, made in the image of God and they will be an opportunity for mission. I, I don't know. So, so we, there's no reason. See, people think that, that if we discovered aliens, that's fatal to Christianity. And they think that for two reasons. Number one, they think it's fatal because uh, it, it, it destabilizes the man-centricness of the, of the, the, the Bible. And, like, and that's why they love to throw it in your face. You know, your skeptic friend was like, there's, the universe is probably teeming with, with, with life, man. And so you're not special. You're not special. That's the underlying subtext. Hey, get in line. We already knew that we were nothing in, in the context of the great vastness of God's creation. Check out Psalm chapter 8. David beat you to it. When I consider the skies and the work of your hands, what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you should think of him. Get in line if you think that the vastness of the, of the cosmos think makes us insignificant. Yeah, we, David beat you to it by 3,000 years, that's all. So, so you don't have to think that the Bible is this thing that puts people on such a pedestal, right? We, are we of special concern to God? Yes, God has a program with us. He has a program with, with the angels. 
So uh, that, there's nothing in there that's fatal. There's nothing in there that's fatal to Christianity. And the second reason they think it's fatal to Christianity is that it, it, um, it goes against uh, our creation story. So the idea is that, that if, if non-living chemicals are creating life, they, like as, as we imagine, as scientists imagine that it did on earth, then, then that's happening everywhere where the conditions are right, and therefore, once again, it kind of blows our, our creation story out of the water. Well, it doesn't. I mean, first of all, if you ask yourself, what's the, what's the most problematic area of the theory of evolution? And it's this, prebiotic evolution. The idea that non-living chemicals could spontaneously generate themselves into a self-replicating biological thing. That's, that's where the theory is the weakest, okay? So right where the theory is the weakest, we have to be wildly optimistic that it could do that. The thing that we know it probably can't do on Earth, th that it's doing it all over the universe, millions and millions of places. So, uh, no, I, I have no issues. If, if, it, uh, if we can imagine that life is... Um, what we're finding is life was designed. All the evidence is pointing to the idea that life on earth was designed. So we find other designed life. This is, not, this is not fatal to my Christian faith. What is the possibility of dinosaur uh, human coexistence based on 1991 discovery of viable tissue DNA found in a T-Rex fossil that was supposedly 65 million years old? Um, so we got a bunch of different streams in this room at, that approach the creation evolution question different ways. So here's what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to weigh in on this, but I'm going to net it out for you. Um, there are three different ways that Christians look at the whole creation evolution thing. Number one is young earth creationism. So you've got this idea that the, the Bible is, or sorry, that the uh, that creation happened about 10,000 years ago. The seven days of Genesis are 24 hour solar days. And that all the Every, everything that was made was made within literally a week, okay? And that was a, roughly in the very recent past. Then on the other end of this, you have theistic evolutionists. And I know some of you in this room probably have been trained, and maybe by your church, to think that those people cannot be real Christians because they're so compromised. And I just, I invite you to rethink that. I really do. I think there are real Bible-believing, like take the scripture seriously Christians who are nevertheless people who believe that that the, the process of mutation and natural selection over long eons is how God brought about life and also human life. Now, that may, there may be problems there. I'm just saying, I invite you to consider that there are real Christian brothers and sisters in that camp. Among them, a guy named Dr. Francis Collins, who led the Human Genome Project, and he is an evangelical guy. He, he, leads a web, he has a website now called the BioLogos Institute, and... and um, they, he doesn't call it theistic evolution. He calls it uh, evolutionary creationism. <laughs> and because he's really trying to make uh, the idea that God could have used the evolutionary process um, palatable to believers who have been taught to think that that's tantamount to total compromise. Okay, so I just want you to open up that there's, that's a box that uh, serious Christians can live in. And then in the middle are progressive creationists. And they would accept the standard age of the universe, 15.7 years, the age of the earth, about four billion years, uh, but that they would dispute the science. They have no particular issue with evo uh, evolutionary theory when it comes to the idea that the earth or the universe could be old. Their issue is with the science. In other words, the Darwin's theory, neo-Darwinism, is not adequate to explain the development of life and its, and its incredible intricacy and design. So they would believe progressive creationists would accept the, the age of the earth and they would probably look at di different ones, different, look at it a different way, that they would look at the seven days of Genesis as creative epochs or the unfolding of um, uh, creative um, potencies by Yahweh uh, over long periods of time and that there's a steady infusion of new information, word, whenever it, it says, and God said, word. And that it was necessary for information to be breathed into the system, okay? Progressive creationists, theistic evolutionists, and young earth creationists. So now what you have to do, and I'm just going to send you off to do this, is you have to figure out the evidence on this and where you're going to live. But I think if you start saying to yourself, wait a minute, if serious Christians can live in all three of these boxes, then this is not a litmus test for theological orthodoxy. And if you can join me there, then we can just be people who follow the evidence wherever it leads. And if this is evidence that leads to young earth creationism, well, thumbs up. 
then let's just follow the evidence wherever it leads. But when you find a, a, um, a discovery like this, you look at it from three, 360 degrees, okay? Look at it from people who are in all three camps. And if you want to, you could also look at it from a fourth camp, which is atheistic evolutionists. Look at it from all the camps and see where the evidence points on this. And as uh, William Lane Craig says, we can just really follow the evidence wherever it leads on this one. We can. Because if evolution is true, it's enormously, enormously improbable. I, I've really, this is a pet subject for me. I'm looking into it quite a bit. I'm really excited about the intelligent design community and um, how they're, I think, this demonstrating a kind of openness to the evidence that Christians haven't been known for in the past. And uh, so they're, they're open to the idea that the universe does appear to be old. Okay, that, that's how it appears. It appears to be old. But it also appears to be designed. And if you're an evolutionist, you have to look at all of the design and say, nope, the design is an illusion. And Christians can say, wait a minute. No, that's, that, 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 it, it appears to be designed. And so I'm not, gonna, I'm, gonna not, I'm not gonna stop believing what my eyes are telling me. So I'm just gonna leave you with that. And this kind of stuff, chase the evidence wherever it leads. And um, know this, that I think unequivocally the, um, the, the design argument stands no matter which box you live in. The design argument stands as tremendous proof of a creator. Okay, let's keep going. Um, uh, is there such a thing as the unforgivable sin? And if so, what is it? Are there varying degrees of sin? Um, okay, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12 or 13, help me, pastor. Uh, he mentions the unforgivable sin. So, um, there he says that the, the sin that cannot be forgiven is a sin against the Holy Spirit, okay? So here's how I, and I, reams have been written about this, I'm gonna really oversimplify it. I believe that the, the unforgivable sin, the sin against the Holy Spirit, Jesus says, all sin will be forgiven man, including sins against the Son of Man, but the sin against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Why not? Because I believe what it's referring to is what the Holy Spirit has come to do. The Holy Spirit comes to bring the saving benefits of the Lord Jesus Christ to a human heart who responds to him by faith. And if you sin against the Holy Spirit, the ultimate sin against the Holy Spirit is to reject what he has come to do. In other words, it is, the unforgivable sin is the sin of rejecting forgiveness. And this is true of relationships even now. Forgiveness is always a two-way street, right? Forgiveness can be offered. In order for the transaction to be complete, it must be received, right? And that is our gospel. That is why not everyone goes to heaven. It's not because God is not willing to forgive everyone. It's that some will not be forgiven, right? So if you look at the unforgivable sin like that, then you, you, if you're worried if you've committed it, you haven't committed it. Because no one who's committed the unforgivable sin worries about such a thing, okay? So that you can kind of take that off the table as, a, as an issue. Now, whether, are there varying degrees of sin? Well, there are absolutely varying degrees of the effects and the consequences of sin. So when Jesus, for example, takes adultery and he, he brings it inside to the, to the life of the mind, he's not trying to tell you that, that uh, inner adultery is as bad as sleeping with your neighbor's wife. It's not. I mean, sleeping with your neighbor's wife will blow up your marriage in a way that your own inner impure thought life will not, likely, although addiction to pornography has almost the same effect. But I will say, so for example, the consequences of certain sins are much, much more extreme. Remember, Jesus also said that there was mental murder, right? So in terms of consequence, there's vast degrees of difference in sin, but all sin separates and that's what Jesus, I think, is getting at. He says, you think you've escaped sin? You're sinless? You're, you stand in, in, in uh, God owes you something because you've managed not to sleep in the wrong beds. You've got it wrong, friend. There has been sin committed and you are separated from God. So um, I hope that explains that. What about those who die but have never received the gospel? Another great question. You guys are really thinking. I don't know, how much time do we have left? Am I out of it? I'm out? <laughs> James going, you're done. All right. Great. Well, hey, guess what? We got another session. So let's let's stop there, and uh, let's uh, let's keep this going um, tonight. Okay. So let's pray. Okay. Let's uh, let's ask God to bless this. God, this conversation is for you. It is about you. We are trying to love you with our minds, 
And so, Lord, we are encouraged when we think that there are reasons for the hope that we have. And so I pray, Lord, that um, we would be among those who are winsome in the way we communicate our reasons. And some of that has come out in these questions here tonight. God, may we be those who can give this reason with gentleness and respect. And may we respect the seeker. May we respect the irreligious person because they are made in the image of God and they are loved by you and there's not a person who doesn't matter to you. So God, may we be just seeing ourselves as links in the chain. You are the ultimate seeker. You are seeking your lost sheep. And so all we are are just those who would be signposts pointing the way. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks guys, we'll keep this going tonight.